Welcome to the Media Library of First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas. We hope and pray you receive a blessing from today's message. First Baptist Church of Troy is a Christ-centered, family-friendly church which offers activities for kids, teens, and adults. You can learn more and contact us by visiting fbctroytx.org. Now, here's today's message. We're going to continue. We're going to end our series, uh, uh, When Life Happens Today. Next Sunday is what? Mother's Day. Okay, I want to make sure you know that because you need to buy Mama a gift if you haven't already. You got, you're getting a, a head start on that uh, as we look at Mother's Day next week. Uh, but today, we'll, again, we'll finish on When Life Happens. And today we're going to be dealing with When Life Happens, dealing with the storm of anger. Dealing with the storm of anger. Now, how many of y'all have ever been angry? How many of y'all were mad at me asking that question, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's just nothing, I don't know, is it me? Am I the only one that you're in line at HEB of the 10 and under, and I've got nine items, and I'm standing behind the person that's got 12? I mean, I got, you know, I'm going, can't you count, can't you? And Kathy goes, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. You know, it's just, uh, 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 no, I mean, we all get upset. We all get angry over a re- uh, for reasons. Um, and our last two sermons, um, we looked at the storms without and how we can deal with them. The storms that come upon us and how we need to deal with them. And today we're going to be looking at a storm that, that builds within us. It's that storm of anger, the storm of anger. It builds inside of us, and it, it can destroy not only us, but it can destroy people around us, our relationships, and, and uh, it, it can just destroy. And so as we finish this series, uh, looking at the storms of, of uh, uh, anger, we're going to go to Scripture for the answer. Because in Scripture, there was a man who experienced the storm of anger. And if, if you will, hopefully you've turned to Exodus 2, Exodus 2, and we'll be looking at verses 11 through 12. And that person who experienced anger many times was a gentleman by the name of Moses. Hopefully you've found verses 11 and 12 of Exodus chapter 2. Years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and observed their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Looking all around and seeing no one, he struck the Egyptian dead and hid him in the sand. Most folks don't really think of Moses as being somebody of anger. They don't associate that with him. Uh, uh, We think of him as a hero of marching the Israelis, getting the Hebrew children through the desert, getting them up to the promised land. But... Anger was actually Moses' Achilles' heel. Uh, And so we're going to look at, briefly, several times, when Moses' anger got the upper hand on his life. We're going to think about why he got angry and uh, what he could have done about it so that we know what we need to do when the storms of anger come upon us. How do we handle that anger? How do we deal with it? And the first thing you can learn from Moses about dealing with the storms of anger is this. Find out what makes you tick so you can handle what ticks you off. Find out what makes you tick so you can handle what ticks you off. The first time you read about Moses' anger is when he was 40 years old and he has decided to identify with the Hebrews. The Hebrews are his biological family. If you remember the story of Moses, uh, Pharaoh had ordered all the Hebrew children to be killed, and, uh, and uh, Pharaoh's mother had him and took him down to the Nile River, put him in a basket and floated him along, and the uh, daughter of Pharaoh found him and took him in as one of her own, knowing that he was a Hebrew, but took him in as one of her own, and he was raised as an Egyptian. And in fact, he would have been next in line for 
Pharaoh, most likely. He could have been Pharaoh of Egypt. And so Moses, though, has decided to identify with the Hebrews, his biological family, instead of Egyptians who had adopted him as a baby. And it was at this point in his life that anger motivated him to commit murder. And uh, as we read this passage, we're told of an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew. And Moses sees it, and he lets his anger get control of him. And he kills the Egyptian, and he hides the body, thinking that no one noticed. Now, if you'll go ahead and read later on in there, you'll find that, oh yeah, it was noticed, and Moses had to run for his life. But the question is, is how could somebody become so angry that they would take the life of another human being in cold blood? How could a man like Moses, who we see as a hero of Scripture, have such a deep flaw? Well, the truth is, Moses has what we would call today issues. He has issues. And so if you have issues, you're not alone. Moses had them also. And Scripture doesn't tell us when he found out that he was adopted, but at some point he did. At some point he figured out he was not an Egyptian. At some point he figured out that he was a Hebrew. And, but he found out and he had to make a choice which people group now was he going to identify with. Was he going to be Egyptian and one day maybe rule Egypt? Or was he going to now identify with the Hebrew slaves that were there in Egypt? He had to make a choice. And Hebrews 11 tells us this, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather, to, rather than to enjoy the short-lived pleasure of sin. Moses made the choice to identify with God's people. But what he did is he failed to deal with the inner issues associated with his choice. When he saw an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew, his anger flared up, and he gave in to temptation to take matters into his own hand. And Moses learned a hard lesson, and that's this. You cannot do the right thing the wrong way and still expect to, be, to do the right thing. You can't do that. James 1.19 says, My dearly beloved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For man's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Anger. Anger is a natural emotion. We all have it. Everyone in this place has gotten angry at one time or another. But it's how we handle our anger that matters. We either control our anger or our anger controls us. Okay? Ephesians, be angry and do not sin. I like the way the New Living Translation puts it. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Understand, being angry is not a sin. Okay? Even God gets angry. We read about that in Scripture. So being angry is not a sin, but letting anger control you is a sin. Anger controlling you to the point that you say things that you probably shouldn't say. Anger controlling you to the point where you do things you probably shouldn't do. Anger controlling you where you react in ways you shouldn't react. And that's what Moses did. And why did he do it? Because he let what made him tick, tick him off. What made Moses tick? What made Moses tick was this. He was filled with compassion and concern for the Hebrews. He was filled with concern over how the Egyptians had been mistreating them. And you can't blame him for being mad. 
You can't blame him for that. You can't blame him for being angered by the injustice that he saw. But Moses did not control his emotions. Instead, his emotions took control of him. And what could have been righteous anger crossed over the line and became sin when it became murder. It was all right for him to feel angry about the injustice. That's what made him tick. That's what made him tick. It was his deep feelings, actually, for the Hebrews that God used to deliver them from their injustices, in which God used him to free them from Egypt and take them to the promised land. But, but Moses fell from that moral high ground when he committed an injustice to deliver someone else from injustice. Folks, it's never right to do wrong in order to get a chance to do right. Know what makes you tick. Know what you are passionate about. And then always be on guard when you're dealing with an issue that you're passionate about. Be careful not to let what makes you tick tick you off. Be aware that your passions are where your temper can get the best of you. Don't compromise your convictions in order to prove a point. Be honest with yourself about your feelings and don't let your emotions control you, but be aware of them and control them. Realize that, that things that make you tick can tick you off. And because Moses allowed his emotions to control him, he became a fugitive from justice and spent the next 40 years in the desert before God called him to go and rescue the Hebrews. He paid the price. You know, the truth is, our weaknesses also aren't just tested a few times. This wasn't the only time that Moses, you might say, well, that was one time, but Moses had plenty of shortcomings with his anger. Moses faced another test of his anger out in the wilderness with the Hebrew, and it leads us to our second guideline for dealing with the storms of anger, and that's this. Count to ten. Count to ten. How many of y'all you had your parents tell you at one time when you were mad, count to ten. Kathy said that the other day when I was in the grocery line. Count to ten. I mean, you know, you got to count to ten. Count to ten. And that's a good suggestion. When you feel that you're getting angry, count to ten before you say something you shouldn't say. Before you do something you shouldn't do. It gives you time to think about your words. It gives you time to think about your actions. Well, Moses was on top of Mount Sinai, receiving the Ten Commandments. Ooh, count to ten. Why not? Right? He should have. He's got the Ten Commandments. And he should have learned from God about counting to ten. He should have learned from God because while he was up on the mountain, God told Moses, he said, man, the people down there, they're, they're, they're doing stuff they shouldn't do. They're worshiping idols they should not, shouldn't worship, man. They're, they're being terrible down there. Moses, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to start all over again with you. You remember what Moses did? He said, God, please don't do that. Don't do that. No, don't do that to the people. Please, please. Count to ten. <laughs> you know, and God, God relented and God said, you know, Moses, I'm not going to do that. Moses should have learned, but he didn't from that I mean, here he is. He's got the Ten Commandments. He's been, uh, the Ten Commandments, now get this. This is the Ten Commandments. God wrote them with his very finger. I mean, he used his finger. God's finger wrote the Ten Commandments that Moses had to bring down Mount Sinai. And Moses coming down Mount Sinai after a glorious encounter with God finds the Hebrews worshiping a golden calf that they had made, engaging in all sorts of fleshly pleasures and getting ready to take that golden calf and follow it back to Egypt, right? I mean... These people, these Hebrews, to show their appreciation, or rather lack of appreciation for God and Moses, as soon as Moses turns his back on them, 
the people make a golden calf to worship and to lead them back to Egypt. And Moses comes down and he sees that. And once again, the storm of anger came upon Moses and took control of his reactions. As he approached the camp and saw the calf and dancing, Moses became enraged. That word right there is an interesting word. It means he shook. He was so mad. Any of y'all ever done that? So mad you just shake. He became enraged and he threw the tablets out of his hands, smashing them at the base of the mountain. You know, a lot of people have thrown things when they've been angry. But what Moses threw really causes you to go, oh man, oh man. The Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God. He threw the Ten Commandments to the ground and smashed them to pieces. What that tells me is this, is when you're angry, it can cause you to break all the commandments. Think about that one. You may get angry with God and decide, like the Hebrews, You're going to serve another God. You may get angry with your spouse and decide that, man, I'm going to break my marital vows. You may get angry with your boss and decide to steal from him or her uh, uh, by becoming careless in your responsibilities, just not caring anymore. You may get angry and murder someone's reputation by gossiping about that person. The storm of anger may lead you to overstepping the boundaries that God gave you for a healthy and happy life to cause you to break those commandments that he's given us. Now, the question as I read this and thought about this is, is was throwing the Ten Commandments to the ground an act of righteousness on the part of Moses or failure of self-control? And as I thought about it, I thought, well, maybe both had a part in it, but I think it was more of a failure of his self-control. And that's the part I want us to look at. You see, we need to learn how to handle our anger when we see others doing things they shouldn't be doing. When people are willfully living a life of sin, it makes us angry. When people do us wrong and they don't seem to care about it, it makes us angry. And one of the reasons for counting to ten is this. It's to give ourselves time to remember how merciful God has been in answering our requests for mercy and grace. Moses could have counted to ten. And he could have thought about how God had shown him mercy and grace even though he had committed murder and how God was now using him to take the Hebrews to the the promised land. He could have counted to ten and not let that emotion control him. Folks, real justice is administered in an unemotional manner. That's the way it should be, in an unemotional manner. That's what counting to ten is all about. It takes our emotions out of it so that we can think clearly. So we need to take time to gain control over our emotions whenever anger does come up within us. Stop. Take a breath. Count to ten. And as you're counting, remember how many times you have angered God and yet He has shown you mercy and grace and lastly when dealing with the storms of anger when they try to overwhelm you remember this don't play God don't play God the third example of Moses' anger is found in the book of Numbers uh, chapter 20 the Hebrews were in the wilderness Complaining about not having anything to drink. They didn't have any water to drink. They were complaining. In fact, they said they'd be better off back in Egypt than out in the desert where they're going to die of thirst. You notice they're always complaining, right? They're kind of like a broken record. They're just 
skipping, just complaining, 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 complaining. They're always wanting to go back to Egypt. Egypt, the place they've been begging God to deliver them from. So God does, and now then they want to keep going back. And you know, I think like it would almost anyone, their complaining was starting to get to Moses. The Hebrews should have learned by now that that they could trust God. But you know what, folks? They never got there. And I think we can all relate to how Moses was feeling. Maybe you've had to listen to the, a, a griping co-worker or friend or family member, and you all just, oh, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. All they do is gripe. Aren't they a joy to be around? Man, you do everything in your power to avoid them. Because they're always griping. They don't, have, they don't have a good word to say about anything, right? They get up in the morning and they first suck down some pickle juice just so they can get that sour look on their face and start complaining. Oh! The only way they're happy is if they're making other people unhappy by always complaining. That's the Hebrew children here. Well... The Hebrew folks, they're complaining about being thirsty. Once again, complaining. And God gives Moses explicit instructions for meeting the needs of the people. The Lord spoke to Moses. Take the staff and assemble the community. You and your brother Aaron are to speak to the rock while they watch. Now then, uh, notice that right there. They're to do what? Speak. And it will yield its water. You will bring out water for them from the rock and provide drink for the community and their livestock. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had commanded him to do. He's doing good so far. And Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Oh, it didn't turn so good. Right? Listen, you rebels, anytime somebody starts talking to you that way, you know this ain't a good thing about to happen. Listen, you rebels, must... Now, what does that word say? We. Who's Moses talking about now? Himself, right? And Aaron. Must we bring water out of this rock for you? Then Moses raised his hand, and he did what? Struck the rock twice with his staff, so that a great amount of water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me to show my holiness in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land I have given them. In anger, Moses hit the rock instead of speaking to the rock like God had instructed him to do. And it was this storm of anger, it was that right there that kept Moses out of the promised land. He'd led them all the way to e- from Egypt, but that bit of anger had hurt him. And you know, that had to hurt. But Lord, look what I've done. I've led these people, I've faithfully fought. Yes, but Moses, you didn't do what I asked you to do. Folks, can you imagine not being able to realize the fulfillment of a lifelong dream? That's what anger can do to you. We, all need, we, we really all need to stop and soak in what happened to Moses there. Let me ask you this question. What of God's blessings is your anger keeping you from enjoying. Think about that. What of God's blessings is your anger keeping you from enjoying? God had said, Moses, command the rock to give you water. Just talk to it, Moses. That's all I want you to do. Just say, rock, water, and water will come out. Whatever you need to do, just talk to it. But Moses was so mad at the people He was so frustrated with them that once again, 
He lost it. He let it control him. And he hit the rock with his walking stick, not once, but twice. Right? He got really angry. And he wanted everyone to know he was angry. Have you ever noticed that angry people want you to know they're angry? They don't keep it in. They let you know, even if they don't say anything, you look at them, you know they're angry, right? They give you that look. It's terrible when you go, what's wrong? Nothing, right? They want you to know. They want you to know they're angry. That's why they throw things. That's why they, they hit things like Moses did. You know, anger can, can reflect uh, fear. It can reflect frustration. It can reflect impatience. And in this instance that we read about here, it not only reflected all of those attitudes in Moses' spirit, but here's what it did, folks. It took away from the glory of God. That's the issue here. It took away from the glory of God. It wasn't Moses hitting the rock that provided for the needs of the people. Remember how Moses said, do we need to? Moses put himself in there. It wasn't Moses hitting the rock that did that. It was God's power. It wasn't Moses' temper that needed to take center stage on that hot and dusty day. But it was God's love and care for his people that needed to be acknowledged. In his fit of anger, here's what Moses was doing. He was robbing God of his glory. Folks, when we allow anger to control us, we're in danger of playing God and judging as only God has the right to judge. Anytime you allow your anger to control you, you, you cease to look like a child of God and you begin to look like a child of the world or the child of the devils whenever anger controls. And that's what Satan's counting on. Don't think that you can accomplish with your anger what God alone can accomplish by his power and love. Don't play God with your anger. That's what Moses did. He took God's glory. He took God's glory. Again, remember, God has surely been angry with you at some time, point in time, but he has always shown you grace and forgiveness and mercy because of his glory. We don't need to rob God of his glory. Don't play God with your anger. You don't have that right. You don't have that right. So the question is, do you have storms of anger in your life? Those storms that, if you allow them to, that will bring destruction on your life by destroying relationships, and you may have already experienced that. Those storms that, if you allow them to, will cause you to forfeit God's blessings that he has for you. Oh, to think that something I may have done in, in anger could have kept me from knowing some of God's blessings. Folks, that hurts. So in dealing with the storms of anger in your life, find out what makes you tick, right? So you'll know what ticks you off and you can be on watch for that. Count to ten. Take time. Don't react. Don't knee-jerk reaction. Count to ten. And lastly, don't play God with your anger. Don't play God. Let God have it. Let God do what He wants to do, and it will always be right. Your job is to show mercy and grace. Mercy and grace and the love of God. Just as God has shown it to you. Let me ask you to bow your heads in prayer. Today, you may need to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You see, one day, if you've not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will meet the wrath of God. 
you will meet the anger of God. And that anger will be because you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you will then be condemned by God for punishment, eternal punishment, in a place called hell. But see, God doesn't want that for you. God wants to show you mercy and grace. He doesn't want you to know His anger. He doesn't want you to know His wrath. That's why Jesus came. And if you'll just pray and ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior, you will know God's mercy and God's grace and God's love. And you do that by just saying, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. Today, I'm asking you to be my Savior. I'm asking you to be my boss. From this day forward, I want to follow you and you alone. And I'm trusting in you for your mercy and grace and eternal life with you one day. If you prayed that prayer, then in a minute in our invitation time, we want to invite you to step out into the aisle and come forward. Take me by the hand and say, man, I prayed that prayer. We will celebrate with you because you're now part of the family. You now know God's mercy and grace. Maybe you've watched us over a live stream and you pray that prayer. Would you please email us and let us know so that we can be praying for you and get some information to you to help you in this new walk with the Lord. Dear Christian friend, maybe you're going, man, I've let anger control my life. I've let it get control of me and I'm not controlling it and I'm not bringing glory to God and by me getting angry, it has cost me, I know, some of God's blessings. Maybe you need to recommit your life. Man, if you'd like to come up to the altar and just kneel and pray, you do that. Where you'll be standing, you can do it there too. But don't leave here not doing something about it. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, man, Man, I like what I see going on here, and I'd like to be a part of this church and this church family. And we'd invite you to come during this invitation time and, and come and join and be a part of First Baptist Church Troy. I know that, that, uh, that if God's leading you to be a part of this church, then that means that you've got gifts and talents we need to help make us a better church. So we invite you also, if God's put it on your heart, to come be a part of this church, to, to come. But let's look inside in those times that we've gotten angry. And let's ask God's forgiveness. And maybe we might need to go to some folks and ask for their forgiveness. They may not even know you've been angry with them. That doesn't matter. You need to release that anger. Because if you don't, that anger controls you. That anger imprisons you. You will never know freedom until you release that anger. Today, would you release it? The storm of anger. And would you be a lookout on lookout for those things that do cause that anger to come? And in life, as we go through, and anger tries to well up, remember, count to ten. And don't play God. We can learn a lot from the life of Moses so that we don't miss out on some of the blessings that God wants to give us as Moses had to do. Father God, Lord, I pray, show us our hearts. And Father, may we, Lord, see those times that we've been angry, when those storms have welled up, and Father, may we desire to do something about them, because Father, those feelings, they, they control us, they imprison us, we're not free from them, they bind us. Father, we need to let those go. We need to let them go, so that we can show others your glory father speak to those times in our areas in our life that we need to let that go father for lord for those that need to pray and ask christ to be their savior lord i pray that they would do that lord for those who you may be leading to be part of this church father i just thank you for that holy spirit this is your time to speak to us lord may our souls be ready to hear from him Holy Spirit, speak. Speak. And may we do as you call us to do. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. From the media team at First Baptist Church of Troy, Texas, we want to say thank you for joining us today. 
If you have additional questions or want to know how you can experience the love of Christ in your life and family, visit us online at fbctroytx.org and send us a message. Thank you and have a wonderful week.